Car crashes are the leading cause of death among teenagers in the United States, so it's understandable that a lot of parents are nervous about handing over the keys. Now one company is offering to tailgate teen drivers without telling them. Basically, spy on your children. The undercover operation reports back to parents with details of how fast the kids are driving, whether they're texting, talking on the phone, and whether they're buckled up. Adam Housley is live with these disgusting parents in Los Angeles. Hello, Adam. <laughs> Hello, Shepard. Only in California, right? Simple idea here. $99 will get you an off-duty or retired police officer for about 20 minutes. They'll follow your teen around, and then when they're all done, they'll, reply to, they'll provide a written report. Now, the teens are told they will be followed at some point, just not when they'll be followed. So it is semi-secret, if you will. We went along for one of these surveillance missions down in San Diego. The young lady we followed around, for, fortunately for her, because she's on television, did a great job as we followed her. And her dad was very glad to see that as well. He even said that even though she did so well down the line, he might do it again. You have nothing to lose. If you get a good report, then it's peace of mind. And if you get a bad report, then maybe you've, uh, you've had off a potential problem for you and other people. So it's for, for less than 100 bucks, I think it's a win-win. And why do this? The numbers are staggering. Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death for teens in the U.S., accounting for 36% of all deaths. Over half of all teen passengers' deaths occur when another teen is driving. They have the lowest seatbelt use of all drivers. Over 90% of teens admit to doing multiple tasks while on the road, things like talking on the phone, eating, channel surfing, or just goofing around with their friends. More teens are killed in uh, car crashes because not just their limited skill set, but because of the distractions on the cell phone, texting, and then having other kids in the car. The number one way teens are dying in the U.S. is in drugs or gang violence. It's dying on the roadway. So that, there's, a, there's a need for it, for sure. And if following Junior isn't enough, Ma and Pa may be next. The program has been pretty successful here. It's moving across the country for teenagers. But now there's a suggestion you might find them following elderly drivers to make sure Grandma and Grandpa are doing the right thing on the road, too. Shepard. Well, that sounds just terrific. Uh, Adam Housley in Los Angeles. Adam, thanks so much. Uh, joining us now is Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst. Go on. Judge Andrew Napolitano. That camera is pesky. <laughs> so, so, you, you, so you spy on your children. This is how to make... The family unit better, and how to teach children about trust, and it's it's also a way for the parents not to concern themselves with whether the kids are good drivers. Let those off-duty cops worry about it. Look, if if, if you're going to just give the kid the keys of your car to your kids because the cops are going to follow your kids, are you going to be concerned with the way the kids are driving? How about teaching the kids how to drive first and not giving them the keys if they don't drive properly? That's issue number one. Issue number two is these are cops. They may be off duty. They may be out of uniform. They still have a government issued badge and a government issued gun. They they're may, still cops. They're still cops. They are still using the power of the government, the badge and the gun and the equipment that also accompanies that, to spy on somebody. Maybe a child, it doesn't matter. Children have constitutional rights like the rest of us. So this is a serious violation of the Fourth Amendment right of the person spied on, whether it's my grandmother or my nephew. This, this spying thing seems to be all the rage in the United States now. We spy on you for everything. Spying is fun and good. And by the way, if we spy on little Johnny and little Janie, then they won't, they won't be bad drivers and they might not die. Starts with the federal government saying if we don't spy on you, we can't keep you safe. And then it makes its way down even to parents spying on children and children spying on their grandparents. Soon we will look like East Germany where when you spied on someone, if you didn't report what you saw, you could be prosecuted for not reporting your neighbor. Do we really want to live in a society like that? That's where this will lead us. Nobody wants kids in accidents. If they're bad drivers, don't let them drive and teach them how to drive. But this, spying is going to make things worse. This bunch that's all worried that we're going to become Greece seems not to care one bit if we become East Germany, and I have no idea why. I don't know why either. Because we're, we're spying at everybody on every turn, online, in the, on the streets. Now we're spying on our children. Everybody thinks, oh, yeah, that's just fine, just fine, greater good. Privacy out the window, and that will bring the government into the bedroom, into the kitchen, and now into the car. Mm -hmm. People are going to be sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, Judge. Thank you. Pleasure to keep, be here. No matter what we talk about, keep, you know it's a pleasure. Keep being be the drum, Judge. <laughs> Thank you. Voice of reason. Thank you. Meanwhile, let's go upstairs to somebody who went to uh, college, to two different colleges, and one that went to one college. <laughs> <laughs> what an intro, Brian. There you go. <laughs>
I think he's talking about uh, the judge went to a couple of colleges, actually maybe three. Uh, and he's here to talk about this. Police cannot walk into your house without a warrant. But when it comes to the internet, there's a line that's a little blurred. This week, the Senate will debate what rules the government must follow if it wants to watch a private citizen online. Do they need permission to track what you type? Fox News senior judicial analyst Andrew Napolitano, the former judge, joins us live. What do you think? Stevie, well, you know, the American people should know that their elected representatives in the Senate are deciding whether or not to allow this government, run by Barack Obama, mm -hmm. or some future government, to capture every keystroke that they touch on their uh, Blackberries and iPhones and computers. Sure. And Most it, people are unaware that the Senate is even considering this. You would think, well, I have the right to privacy. I have the right freedom of speech. What business is it of the government's what I type in my computer? At work, obviously, your employer would be entitled to see whatever you right. type. But right. that's at work. We're talking about at home. The government would be able to look into the email, the private email I send to you or to Brian or Gretchen or anybody right. else. Right. Look, we have the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which basically says you have the right to be left alone. If the government wants to know something about you, your banking records, uh, what you may have in your, in your basement, they have to go to a judge and get a search warrant. That's right. That's to protect this right to privacy. The Senate is considering allowing the government to capture every keystroke, every single keystroke, without a warrant just on a whim, just on a fishing expedition. That will change radically the relationship of law enforcement to average Americans, perhaps in a way Americans have never experienced before. Judge, that's the wrong direction. It absolutely is the wrong direction. It's also wrong that the Senate should even be considering this. Absolutely. The Fourth Amendment has worked pretty well for 230 years. It can work well for another 230 years if the government doesn't try and tinker with it. All right, well, let's see what the Senate does. No uh, predictions. Yeah, that would be. But, but people should tell their senators. Don't do this. Yeah, indeed. All right, Judge, thank you very much. Pleasure, Stevie. You went to two How colleges, many schools right? did kill me two, go three, to? Oh, don't even. How ask. long did it take him to graduate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, bro. Uh, what is it, 32, 33 days, time running out to hammer out a deal to avoid that fiscal cliff. The president says he'll veto any bill that does not raise taxes on the rich. Some Republicans seem ready to cave, violating their pledge not to hike taxes. But Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano says Republicans who relent and do that do that at their own peril. They pr a lot of them reelected just a couple of weeks ago. They promised they wouldn't raise taxes, and now some are thinking, you know, would that be so bad? Maybe not. You know, there's about uh, six or eight of them. Some very well-known Republicans, John McCain uh, among them, Peter King, who's a friend of a lot of us on the show. Congressman King and I went to college together, went to law school together. He was an undergraduate when I was in law school at, at Notre Dame, and he knows that sometimes I tweak him. Jeff Flake uh, is also a friend of the show. Uh, Bob uh, Corker. These guys promised as recently as a month ago they would not vote to raise taxes under any circumstances. Right. Guess what they learned? They learned the lesson from Barack Obama. Give away the people's money and they'll vote for you. Sure. So rather than voting to shrink the government, to, to lower entitlements, to get rid of the debt, to put the government back within the confines of the Constitution, to let hardworking Americans keep more of their money, they're going to vote to raise taxes, yeah. and they're going to violate the very pledge they make. They should remember a very famous pledge made by a very famous and at the time well-liked Republican. Do you remember this? I do. Read my lips. No, no new taxes. taxes. And when he violated that pledge, whoosh, the voters threw him out of the White House. Absolutely. So, what? what, what but. At this stage in the negotiations, you know, some uh, John Boehner has made it very clear he will not raise the tax rates. He, he's looking at other ways to raise revenues, maybe close uh, loopholes you know and stuff that, like that. To but me, we don't need to raise the rates Steve, close to forty percent. Okay, Steve, when they say that. I think they're being disingenuous. The issue it's is all not part rates. It's the negotiation dance. I, I respect the fact that in, in, in negotiation, you sometimes take positions that you don't really expect to sure. end up with. Lyndon Johnson used to say, you never want to watch them make sausage or legislation because the, the give and take is, it can be unpleasant. But when they are talking about not raising rates and instead getting rid of deductions, it doesn't matter. Whatever takes more money from hardworking Americans and gives it to the government takes it from the productive part of a society and gives it to the consuming sure. part of a society. That doesn't cause prosperity. And the last line of your column on uh, called Republicans in Texas, which is at foxnews.com, is regarding Bush 41, and it says... I bet George Herbert Walker Bush would abide by his pledge today.
I bet you're right. Just a guess. Hindsight, Just a guess, always Stevie. 2020. All right. <laughs> Andrew Napolitano, we thank you very much, Judge. Bless you, guys. Well, Egypt is still a much divided nation. There's a proposed new constitution out there at the center of a showdown between its judges and the Islamist members of the government, who are all allies of the president, who's gone off the rails, as you know. At issue is how power will be divided in Egypt less than two years after the revolution that ended dictator, uh, decades of dictatorship. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano was here. You know, I, it, the best way to describe what Mohamed Morsi did was he came in basically and tried to make himself a dictator. He did. He did. He, he came in initially as the man of the people, as yeah. the first popularly elected um, exec, chief executive of Egypt in its 3,000 year history. And within a year of being in office, he said, the courts can't overrule me, and nobody can sue me, and nobody can second-guess me, and whatever I say is the law. And it caused a, a lot of disturbance even among his own people. While he was doing that, he got the, the legislature, which was also elected with him, to write a new constitution uh -huh. without any debate, without any input, and against the rules of the present constitution, and he's just putting it out there for the public to vote on. Why are the judges so upset? Well, the, the Egyptian system of judges is very similar to ours and to the British system. Judges can say to the government, that's unconstitutional, you can't do it. Not so in the Islamic world, which is what this new constitution will have. Their goal and object and oath will be fidelity to Sharia law, not to the Western law of individual rights and divided powers as we understand it. Well, that's, the, that's the problem right now. Egypt is arguably the most powerful because of its sheer numbers, 80 million people in Egypt. In that region, they, they're overseeing so much of what's happening in that region, including the, the peace treaty of sorts between, between Hamas and the, Palestin, uh, of the Palestinians and the Israeli government. If Egypt is in that sort of turmoil, the world is a shakier place. Well, that's, that's the, the problem that rests at the feet of the United States because they understand, Obama administration understands exactly what you said. That they need stability in Egypt. They don't necessarily need a dictator replacing another dictator, which is basically what Mohamed Morsi will have done, a secular dictator who, whose tyranny is not based on a religious order versus a religious dictator whose tyranny is based on one a religion. And if you're not in that religion, or if you're in that religion and you don't want to follow it, you, you're, you, you can't live your life the way you want. Be very, very serious if he goes through uh, with this constitution. Their constitution, the one he's proposing, will look a lot like Iran's if it's passed in which the real power resides in the religious dictates that are, that are issued by the head of the uh, Islamic religion in the country. Well, the moderates and others have walked out of all these discussions. They're like, you're just going to railroad this through. We're not even going to sit here I and watch I think the judges are going to invalidate it, and you're going to see more riots in the streets. Mm. Man, a lot. They've been through a lot, Judge. They have. Thank you. Pleasure, Shep. Well, it doesn't have to do with the law. Uh, they risk their lives to protect our country, but should they lose their right to protect themselves? Well, U.S. veterans deemed too mentally incompetent to handle their finances are automatically entered into a national criminal background check system. So when their names are entered, that prevents them from buying or owning a gun. So should the Second Amendment right of those veterans be taken away. Let's talk to Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning, guys. Judge I'm, I'm as upset as Brian about the giant case. <coughs> I'll do my best. I know morning. it. So in the defense bill, there is a sticky issue about whether or not uh, veterans should be allowed to carry guns. You know, the, the right to keep and bear arms is a natural right. Somebody threatens you, somebody punches you in the nose, you have the right to punch them back. Someone threatens your life with a gun. If you're armed, you have the right to defend yourself, your family, and your property. Right. This is a right that belongs to you by virtue of, a, of your humanity. It's not a gift from the government. You don't need a permission slip sure. to defend yourself. Yet this legislation would permit bureaucrats in the VA, a, a poorly managed health system, but one provided by the government exclusively for veterans, to make an evaluation as to whether or not a veteran is uh, competent to keep and bear arms. Right. This is not power that we repose into the hands of bureaucrats. If a person is utterly incompetent, there are procedures for this that sure. allow them to make their own case before a judge, not a bureaucrat in, in, a, in a hospital admission center. But how does it go from, uh, I don't understand why, whether or not somebody can balance their checkbook has anything to do with whether or not they should bear arms. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think most people watching us probably agree with you, but a lot of people in the government 
who in their heart are against the right to keep and bear arms, who think that only the police should have guns and we shouldn't be able to defend ourselves, will find every opportunity they can to keep law-abiding people from having guns. And this is one of those opportunities. Think of it this way. Virtually every veteran is trained in the use of a gun. Granted, the training was years ago, right. but they have basic training in how to uh, defend themselves. They know more about the guns than the people making the evaluation about about sure. them in the hospital. Sometimes I have trouble balancing my checkbook. We all do. That's no basis for taking away sure. a natural right. Well, it'll be interesting to see what finally does happen. All right, uh, Judge Napolitano, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure, guys. No matter what we talk about. Don't forget That's to right. carry the one. <laughs> <laughs> a soldier's fight to keep custody of his five year old daughter has now reached the nation's highest court. Jeffrey Chafin's estranged wife is from Scotland. And when the U.S. deported her last year, she won the right to take their daughter to Scotland under an international treaty. Today, the case is before the U.S. Supreme Court in what could be a landmark ruling for military parents. Shannon Bream is live for us in Washington. Shannon, what options does the father have at this point? Well, Trace, not many. When he lost that initial decision that sent his daughter to Scotland, he tried to appeal. But courts here in the U.S. told him they have no jurisdiction. She's gone, and his only option is to try to fight for her in the Scottish legal system. He refused to give up, though, vowing to get to our country's highest court as quickly as possible. He was there today, and here's what he said. It's, it's my little girl. Uh, you know, when I said goodbye to her uh, October 12th, I told her I was going to do everything I could. And today, people listen. He had the justice's ear today, and he knows this goes far beyond just him and the impact that it will mean for many other military families and Americans across the board. Trace. Indeed, Shannon. But what's the mother saying? You know, she actually was deported from the U.S. after getting into legal trouble here, so she couldn't return for today's arguments. But her attorney says it's time to leave the little girl where she is. Here's what he said from court. The child has to have... Uh, stability. She's five years old. She's back in one country. The idea of making her a ping pong ball and bringing her back to America two, three years down the line just isn't fair. He said the international treaty that both Scotland and the U.S. have signed on to was there for a reason, and in his words, it settles the matter. What about the justices, Shannon? How are they reacting today? Many of them seemed very skeptical about how this all played out and the fact that the, the father essentially has no right to appeal this decision. Here's what Chief Justice John Roberts said during the arguments, quote, the incentives, if you prevail, meaning the mother's attorney, are for the parent with control over the child to leave immediately. Get on the first plane out and then you're home free. That seems to me to be a very unfortunate result. Could be weeks, even months, though, before we know what the court ultimately decides. For now, the little girl will stay in Scotland. Trace. Hmm. Shannon Bream, live for us in Washington. Shannon, thank you. Joining us now, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Trace. I'm fascinated by what, uh, what Shannon was saying there about Chief Justice Roberts saying, in essence, look, what happens is you have the mother that got on a plane, the father was using the proper legal channels, mom gets on a plane, takes the kid, and so now she wins? Yeah, you know, it's, thoughts, very, Judge? It, it's very unusual. There's a lot of factors here. This is essentially the interpretation of an international treaty. And quite frankly, the treaty was written to address situations like this. A uh, married couple with children who travel a great deal. So it's a classic case to address members of the military. Married couple with children where each, each party to the, to the marriage is from a different country. The other factor here is something the Supreme Court hates. Cases involving domestic disputes, uh, custody over children, divorce cases. None of these justices have experience with it. This is typically in state courts, not in the federal court. So what the chief justice is saying about it is something we can all understand. The father lost at a federal trial court in Atlanta. Before he had the opportunity to appeal that loss, the mother took the child and flew to Scotland. And then when he filed the appeal, the appellate court said, too little, too late, because the mother's not here, and because the child's not here, and because this case is controlled by an international treaty, we don't have jurisdiction over it. The Chief Justice says, well, well, that's not right. She shouldn't have left with the child before the appeal was filed, and probably the appellate court should have heard the appeal. 
So my guess is that the Supreme Court today will say to the Federal Appeals Court in Atlanta, hear the appeal, decide if the trial yeah. judge was right or wrong. Where is this child more accustomed to living, with his father in Alabama or with his mother in Scotland? That's what the treaty tells judges they have to decide. Yeah, it really does come down to the whole habitual residence thing, where the child normally lives, Judge. But, but the fact that the girl is now in Scotland, does that make this entire argument moot? Well, it doesn't make it moot, but it makes the mother's case stronger because one of the principals, having ruled on more custody cases than I like to think, I didn't have any gray hair until I got these custody cases. <laughs> one of the basic principles of custody law is you can't move the child around too much. Even if the child is with the lesser in terms of benefits for the child of the two parents, the mere removal of the child from a parent to whom the child has grown accustomed, the mere removal of the child from a home setting to which the child is accustomed can have an adverse psychological effect on that child. Stated differently, the longer the child stays with the mother in Scotland, even if she's not the appropriate yep. parent, the more difficult it is for the courts to say, bring the child back to Alabama. Yeah, and the lower the, other, the father's odds get. Judge Andrew right. Napolitano, good of you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure, Trace. You know what? If you're going to text your husband right now, just to say something sweet, like, I love you, have a great day, eh, better start watching what else you might text to your family and friends, because if law enforcement agencies get their way, there will soon be a federal law that requires cell phone carriers to keep every one of your private text messages for two years. They argue those messages can be the key to solving crimes. But does uh, keeping those texts violate your constitutional rights? Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano says absolutely. You know, the, the, the government is always looking for shortcuts yeah. to keep us safe. And they usually request these shortcuts after a tragedy. Right. So some nut shoots people in a theater and there's a call for uh, a gun control. Let me see all of his email. Correct, Let me see correct. All of we his had a tragedy records. with a young sure. boy murdered in, in Rhode Island. And there was some text uh, messaging that would have pointed to the... Uh, pointed to the true killer. The police seized it, but they did so unconstitutionally. Right. The whole purpose of the Constitution is to protect our rights from a government that is too strong, that is too aggressive, that tries to keep us too safe to the point where it is arresting people on a whim and seizing their information uh, on a hunch. And the Constitution mm -hmm. was written to prevent that. But now the government comes along and police organizations are lobbying the Congress for legislation that would require private telecoms to, and, and, and computer servers to retain text messages in case the police need them. They can't do that. Right. They can't tell these companies Because right now they, they might keep them a day, they might keep them a month, there is no standard. It costs money to keep them. Yeah. Well, that, okay, that was going to be my first point. But let's say there is some sort of a criminal action that happens and police, they have subpoena power, don't they? To, to take people's phones and see who texted them and then just go to those if particular individuals. You know, I, I've often told the story. When, when I was on the bench, we would periodically have 24-hour duty, meaning we were the judge to whom police would come in an emergency situation. So they came to my home at 3 in the morning, at 6 in the morning. They caught me in the courthouse as I was leaving. In your bathroom. At 5 or 6 in the afternoon, in my gym shorts. Not necessarily a pretty sight. A <laughs> friend of mine issued a search warrant from the back of a motorcycle mm -hmm. on a Saturday afternoon. Now, there's a record of what the police right. wanted. There's an oath taken by the cop that there is a crime going on, and we believe this person has evidence of the crime. And thus, the Constitution sure. is enhanced. You can always get a search warrant in a very short period of time. You don't need the shortcuts because little shortcuts lead to big shortcuts. Right. And before you know it, we have no privacy. And, and before you know it, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, we got to hang on to all the text messages for two years. Okay, they're going to sit somewhere in a great big server vat. Uh, there is no, you know, who exactly would have access to it? And there are a million questions about, okay, suddenly they've got a great big record of all the stuff we've been doing, and we don't need that. The Fourth Amendment resolved this in 1791. They did. The people are entitled to privacy and security in their purses, persons, places, papers, 
and things. And you were right about purses. And even though they didn't envision... <laughs> purses, too. And, <laughs> and they didn't envision your, your cell phone in your purse back in the 1700s, but you say it still uh, stands today. Here's what Verizon says on sharing text info. Protecting our 93 million customers' privacy is one of Verizon Wireless's highest priorities. Yet, we also have a legal obligation to provide customer information to law enforcement. It's a little vague, isn't it? Well, it, the, the Verizon is trying to have it both ways. Yeah. Verizon yesterday applied for a patent that if you have uh, if you have its product to receive its uh, cable signals will allow them to see what's going on in your living room and if by, trust by me, a camera yes if Verizon can see it then the government will be seeing it and so they, they really are talking out of both sides of their mouth I have nothing against the against the company and I'm I'm a customer but but that's really going too far yeah that that's wow. not a good thing okay. all right judge always pleasure, a pleasure. guys no matter what we talk about it's always a pleasure thank, let me pass out just for a minute at, at that knowledge of my living room being exposed <laughs> okay thanks can judge. I go out and ride that camel or it's kill me yeah go ahead uh, it's okay, around for uh, okay wait a minute the judge has now entered the pool oh. so far the votes were for were going in my favor so okay. let's enter the judge into the pool as well the judge on the camel yes everyone vote in thanks judge oh god love you well, the president and the White House continue to talk about taxes, uh, specifically about raising rates for high earners, uh, not talking about spending cuts. Republicans want to focus on that, obviously, as these negotiations move forward. Let's bring in our panel on the fiscal cliff. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Juan Williams, columnist with The Hill, and Byron York, chief political correspondent of The Washington Examiner. Judge, what do you make of all of this? We've had a lot of back and forth. We talk about this every day. Uh, but every day there are developments. The, the, the president's insistence on raising tax rates and just raising tax rates is reprehensible and violates Economics 101. Raising tax rates will not necessarily produce more revenue. The president is more interested in regenerating class warfare to punish the rich which is perceived as a reward to his base and doesn't put more money in the federal treasury. And if the Republicans give in to this in the spirit of compromise, and I respect and commend Alan Simpson, he's a great man who's done a lot of service to the country. But this is a time for Republicans to say no to more spending, no to more borrowing, no to more taxes. Do you know any Republicans who were sent to Congress to facilitate the president spending us into oblivion? I don't. They were sent to Congress to say no. And they must do that, or they will be sent home from Congress the next time they're up for re-election. But you heard me ask Senator DeMint, the president feels like he was elected on a campaign in which he mentioned on the stump many times raising tax rates for right. top earners. I, I understand that, but under our system, the Congress writes the laws and the president enforces them. And if one house of the Congress is not going to go along with the laws the president wants, it's not going to become the law. And then we won't let him borrow anymore, and he can't spend more than what the, uh, what the Treasury collects. He'll be forced to reduce his spending. That's the only way we're going to get our house in order. So go over the cliff. Over the cliff. It's really hard to envision an ultimate scenario in which tax rates for the top bracket don't go up. Because constitutionally, Judge, the debt ceiling and that limit, that vote, you it, know, it, it, has, you, it has to be a vote. It has been a vote by the Congress since they began borrowing money in the Wilson administration. No president has ever argued, much less triggered, borrowing money without approval from the Congress. It's a statute, and a statute can only be changed by the Congress. If the president were to attempt to borrow money without authorization from the Congress, any member of Congress can go to a federal judge here in Washington and get him enjoined in about an hour. Now, Jeff, but do you but, think you know, it should be a part of this negotiation, a part of the Republicans' leverage? In this you know, you're, you're talking to somebody who believes that the government should not borrow any money under any circumstances unless it were necessary to, to preserve the republic, such as in, in World War II. But these are two different deals. Obama's overreach is one thing, and whether Republicans can use the debt uh, ceiling when it comes up in February or March, whenever it comes up, that's another thing they're kind of divided on because that's another area where Republicans are going to take a big beating in the, in the no, public. No, but the president wants the deal... He, he wants, wants it done before the fiscal cliff. I think they want to separate this yeah. out. Well, let me just add in here, though, Judge, to your point that no Congress has ever used the fiscal cliff, uh, used the, the debt ceiling as a bargaining point, which is what happened last year. And so this is something we've never well, dealt with. What would happen if the Congress said no? The president would be forced to, to uh, operate the federal government within the money that is available to him. You know, it's just a shock, I think, to everybody that Jim DeMint 
would voluntarily leave the Senate of the United States. Judge? Well, I was as surprised as uh, Juan and Byron were and you and, and people watching us now, but I agree with Juan and Byron and uh, Eric Erickson. Jim DeMint is a classic, traditional, Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan, conservative Republican. None of this George Bush compassion, compassionate, conservative, mealy-mouthed stuff. He really believes that the states have a role uh, in, in government, that the individual is, is greater than the state, that the government should shrink. He's now the most powerful Republican in town. He has an extraordinary megaphone. This is not an inside the beltway story. This is a Jim DeMint is the leader of the conservative Republicans in the country story. And they couldn't have a nicer, more true to, to core values or more articulate spokesman than they have as of today. Well, now, ask me if I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think that he's using this platform to possibly run for president? Well. I, I know he gave you that, that uh, very uh, the typical, humble, and uh, diplomatic answer. But I think a lot of people, when they, they learn of his views and ability to articulate them, will come to him and ask him to run for president. He also will do something that very few other Republicans will do, bring the libertarians back into the Republican Party. He understands the enormous number of them, between 5 and 10 million, depending upon what poll you look at and, and how many votes you, you uh, calculate. And he embraces a lot of views that libertarians embrace as well. But do you agree with Juan that the Tea Party's influence has diminished significantly? Because uh, John Boehner is afraid of them. That's why he kicked them off of the important committees. In terms of the heartland, I think the, the Republican voters want real Republicans they don't want middle-of-the-road compromisers, and Jim DeMint is a real Republican. This is Nick. Morsi may be getting a dose of his own medicine. Let's bring in the judge, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. His, his chicken's kind of coming home to roost here. Yes, right? exactly. I mean, this is the way he took power when the, the mobs had had enough of Hosni Mubarak. How did Hosni Mubarak become the president of, of Egypt? In a military coup. And he stayed there for 30 years. He had nominal elections, but nobody was permitted to run or campaign against him. The Muslim Brotherhood challenged, 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 had riots in the streets, had demonstrations in the streets. The military shot some of the demonstrators. The military backed off. President Mubarak were, ran from the palace. Sound familiar? It's pretty close to the description Jonathan just gave us about what happened to President uh, Morris uh, in the past week or so. So he's on very, very thin ice attempting to resist the very forces that he unleashed, which got him into power in the first place. Well, we're, we're, we're not at the stage yet where the military has been called on to do anything against the people. That is the, the possibility of a next step. And you wonder if maybe Mohamed Morsi might have a smarter thing to do here. A lot of world analysts suggest that if he were to bring in the opposition, make them part of the government, this might settle down. Well, it might settle down. What also might cause this to settle down is if he um, proposes a constitution that is lawfully written and one that recognizes people's differences, differences of opinion. This constitution is unlike anything Egypt has had. Believe it or not, the constitution Egypt has is remarkably modern and remarkably Western, and it permits a person aggrieved by the government to challenge the government in a court. The new constitution would not permit that. That's one of the reasons the judges went on strike, because they would basically be just functionaries uh, deciding civil lawsuits. They couldn't interfere with any extra constitutional behavior on, on the part of the government should this new constitution become law. It was also written by a legislature that they have declared was unlawfully elected. It was not written by the constitutional committee that the present constitution says has to write a new constitution. It's not a tidy process, as we know from history this exercise of democracy, but right. at, at least until the point where he sticks the military on his own people, something seems to be working a little bit. While a lot of people are happy that he's there, he was popularly elected, it was not a close election, and he won a substantial victory. But if the military shoots anyone... That changes things. Correct. I mean, President Mubarak was tried prosecuted and acquitted of using the military to kill people. President Morsi has ordered him tried again and again until he's convicted. This is the very same thing that President Morsi is threatening to do himself. He will not survive that politically. He may not even survive it uh, biologically. The, the days ahead are critical. Yes. And it's not just for Egypt. I mean, lest you think Egypt is an isolated issue, that's the largest, that's the largest company in that country in that region. And without them, peace will be difficult to attain. Judge, thank you. Pleasure, Chef. As we told you earlier this hour, class is canceled now for many schools in Michigan today. Teachers are calling out sick to protest a proposed law to make union membership in that state optional. So if the bill becomes law today, will the unhappy unions be looking for 
Payback. Joining us now, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Um, payback, first of all, we, we need to point out, Governor Snyder, all he has to do is sign it and it becomes law, right? Right, right. I don't, know, I don't know against whom there would be payback because this is as a result of a referendum in November in which the Michigan voters said we don't want collective bargaining here and it's really up to the legislature. Collective bargaining is not a part of the Constitution in the state of Michigan, nor is compelled union membership. Right now in Michigan, if you are in certain industries, as an example, the automobile industry, you are forced to join the union. If you don't join the union, then the government forces your employer to deduct the equivalent of your union dues from your paycheck and give it to the union. That's money that you're entitled to going to an organization that you choose not to belong to. You see, there's something called the First Amendment, which says we have freedom of speech and freedom of association. Freedom, freedom of association also means the freedom not to associate. But for generations, the states have trampled this right. Now, the right is resurgent again. And as we can see in, from Wisconsin last year and from Michigan today, uh, the right is triumphant. And I believe Indiana last year. Yes. So now you have 24 states that have decided to, to do this. I find it interesting, though, because in the election, the Michigan people voted for President Obama in that state. Yes. But they're fractured in a sense because they voted then for something that he is violently against, which is, I mean, he was in the stump in Michigan yesterday yes. saying that, that, you know, you should never let this happen. This is bad for the work. Sometimes uh, the voters are more sophisticated than we might give them uh, credit for and that they can distinguish and not necessarily vote uh, a party line. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the Democratic Party nationally, the president, and in Michigan, favor collective bargaining. But clearly, the voters in Michigan decided we all have individual rights and we're not going to let the but state interfere the party, with them. Does the party like that because the unions give so much money to the party or because they believe in the strength of the union and helping the worker? Well, there's probably a little bit of all of it, but we do know that this is, uh, this is a vicious circle because the unions give money to politicians who then become office holders, who then enact laws that the unions like, and so the unions keep uh, re-electing them. Occasionally, the voters will interfere with that, and that's what happened uh, in Michigan last month. And, um, Judge, we need to point out, in the state of Michigan, the unemployment rate is 9.1% in the surrounding states. It's substantially lower than maybe they're just trying to keep a few jobs in the state. You know, uh, the automobile industry is suppressed no matter how much cash the federal government's going to borrow from China and, and pump into it. My uh, impetus here is personal freedom, mm -hmm. your ability to choose whether or not you want to join a union and whether or not you want to pay the dues without the government forcing you to go one way or the other. All right, we've got to wrap it up there, Judge. Always great to see you. Pleasure, guys. Have a good one. Just into Fox News and brand new on Fox News Channel. Details on the Portland Mall shooter in his own words. Here's his picture. And we've just gotten a hold of what many of his friends tell Studio B is the gunman's Facebook page. He's 22 year old Jacob Tyler Roberts. Cops say he opened fire in that crowded mall near Portland with a semi automatic, semi automatic rifle, killed two people, seriously wounded a teenage girl on top of that, and killed himself. So here's the Facebook page part. It indicates he was in a relationship. And he said he worked at, quote, the most badass gyro shop in town. Or you would say Euro in many parts of the country, but here in New York we say gyro. The most interesting details are likely in the bio. The shooter wrote this. If you were to ask someone that knows me, they would probably say that I am a pretty funny person that takes sarcasm to the max. I'm the kind of person that is going to do what I want. There is no reason for another person to tell you what to do. I'm the conductor of my choo-choo train. I may be young, but I have lived one crazy life so far. My friends are my family, and I don't think that will ever change. I've done a lot for myself in the past year, some good and some bad, but I still press on. I like to think of myself as a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Yep, that's right. I'm a junkie. Laugh out loud. The words from a man cops say set out to kill as many people as possible. They say his gun jammed, and at some point, according to the cops, he shot and killed himself. Let's take it to the judge, our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. This is mighty sad, Judge. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if having seen this ahead of time, 
that anyone could no. conclude he's about to kill somebody. I mean, this, these are the, the rantings of a youth. Yeah, he needs to go back to grammar school and right. such. But I mean, it's, it's, it's sloppy, it's weird. There's probably a lot of different ways to, yeah. uh, to interpret it. And, of course, this was a tragedy for which there can, be, there can be no justice. He's dead. There's no question that he did it. There's no question that he was in another world. There's no question that uh, innocence died as a result of it. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of this stuff that goes on, and we're not starting hand any gun talk around here because that does not help anybody. No. But I, I don't know. I don't know what you do. Well, I mean, we, we don't know enough about this guy. We don't know who might have been aware of his uh, mental deficiencies. He stole the gun, by the he way. Stole the gun. You know, so so the the gun laws. Whatever. Right, we're not going to talk about it here. Okay, God so knows. It's, it's, it's not crazy. It's not. It's not an issue to be addressed uh, in this case. What what no. would be addressed in this case is is there some way that law enforcement, or even his employers, could anticipate this explosion that he was going to have? And the answer is no. In a free society, and I won't talk about uh, guns, yeah. but in a free society, these things happen. The government doesn't monitor our brains, and occasionally people snap. And they do awful things. How does this, this happen so much more in this that. country than other countries? I don't uh, get it. Well, because we have more of an attitude of uh, personal freedom, and, and yeah. people don't think of the consequences of their behavior. I mean, you you know, not far from where I live, just two days ago, yeah. there was a, a contract killing uh, on a public street. Obviously, the killer thought he could get away, and maybe he will, or maybe he won't. But people don't think of the consequences of their uh, of their behavior. And if they want to kill somebody, they're going to find a way to do it. Yeah. You know, it, the, just the thought of all these little kids at the Santa place, you know, Santa was in the mall. Right. And this crazy guy coming in there. I, Look, if there's, if, if there's any consolation here, this does not appear to be organized. No. This does not appear to be foreign directed. Another this does not be, uh, appear to be an, a, an act of terrorism. This does not appear to have been uh, done to affect the change in the government's policy. This just appears to have been a lone, lonely, mm -hmm ill, crazy person who's got his hands on, on the means to kill people and, and would have done so if either he used another means. Our producer, Kim Eagle, talked to one of his friends a couple of days before. They were going to go shooting at the gun range. He had these guns that he liked. They were going to go shooting. They were all excited. He sold the guns, and the friend was like, why did you sell the guns? And then he showed up at the mall and killed people. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, he I, stole the gun that he used. He wasn't even one of the... Right, right, right. You, you, you wonder if this is something that he planned and then changed his mind and then decided to, uh, to do it again. Yeah, look, if he had lived and he planned it, then you're talking about first-degree murder and the death penalty if, uh, if convicted. But the on-again, off-again, on-again, off-again shows deliberation, yeah. which also shows a guilty and a sane mind. An yeah. insane person usually does not deliberate. A sane person deliberates. He's about where he belongs now, sadly. All right, Judge. Thank you. Pleasure, Shep. Should the government be allowed to look in on your private life in the name of keeping everyone else safe? The law that gives them the freedom to do that is about to expire, mm -hmm. so should it be renewed? I think we're talking about the Patriot Act. Uh, joining us right now, a man who has not made up his mind on this. Ah. <laughs> judge Andrew Napolitano, he's still deliberating, so you can work it you, out with us. You know, it out a little bit, Judge. You know better than anybody on the planet that yeah. I've made up my mind. Uh, four years, five days a week, we did battle on this. Every on, day. On a wonderful radio show, now called Kill Meet and Friends. Yes. And it's even better. But All you right. have not, you, you have not made, you are, you are, you get up in the uh, morning I, fighting this fight. I do get up in the morning fighting when the government takes freedom and when it does it stealthily. The House of Representatives passed this last month without any vote, what, oh, excuse me, with a vote, but without any debate whatsoever. What is this? This is an extension of the FISA law, which was amended by the Patriot Act, which basically says the government does not need a search warrant to listen to the phone call of any foreign person outside the United States when they're talking to somebody in the United States. So if you call a cousin in Europe mm -hmm. or a business colleague in Asia, the federal government can listen to what you say. If you email them, they can read the emails. They don't need a search warrant. They don't need suspicion. They don't need to keep records of this. And your privacy is shot. But what about if all I say is Yagtala Svenska? Well, Why do I care? I, I don't know what that means, but the government will, because the government has the best translators in the world. And you should care, because this will bring us like East Germany, when everybody is watching everybody else and people are afraid to be themselves because they know somebody is listening. That's why we have the Fourth Amendment. I, I get that argument. I, I wonder how many terrorists activities or terrorist plots have been stopped by this program? You know, a good question, and we probably will never know. Because it's because a question the of the risk. What, what, right. Which is the greater risk? That, you know, some foreign, we listen in on some international phone calls, or another 9-11? 
That's a very good question, and that's a judgment that the Congress is not permitted to make. Because the Fourth Amendment says that's what they're doing by that is what they're doing. When the Congress changes the Constitution, it is vi it is acting unconstitutionally. Only the states. Mm -hmm. You just talked about amending the Constitution. Here. Only the states can change the Constitution. Right. So the Fourth Amendment says you want to snoop, get a search warrant. Judges sit 24/7. I used okay. to issue search warrants at three in the morning. So read your column on FoxNews.com, and I hope I see you on Studio B today. I'll be hosting for Shepard, and I hope you're my guest. What a lively Thursday this will be. No kidding. Uh, Billy, you still with us? Uh, I'm I'm still still I haven't made up my mind. <laughs> now I'm sensing you have. Uh, <laughs> An early uh, Merry Christmas, guys. Make up your